Welcome to Dr. Roger and Friends, the bright side of longevity, hosted by three peas in a podcast, Doc Roger, Teresa, and Danielle. Thanks for joining us for Coffee and Conversation. Well, welcome, everybody. Um, good to see you, ladies. You look well. It's nice that spring is here and summer's around the corner. For some of us, more than others, in Fresno, California, it's not too bad. Or Florida, for that matter. I guess it's all me who's really celebrating the flowers and everything. But uh, just got off a road trip where we went around the country pretty much, and it's really nice seeing it come alive. Uh, with people as well as foliage and fauna. Well, today um, we've been talking about this. We've been wanting to do this for a while, haven't we? Uh, we want to talk today about nutrition in context. And if you're looking for a diet that's going to save you, if you're looking for you know what you should eat for lunch and dinner and and how much of it and weigh it and everything, you're not going to get that today. <laughs> <laughs> what you're going to get, I think, are some very, very core ideas and principles and important facts that have to do with what we put in our mouths and in our bodies. Uh, and I think it's, uh, you know, it doesn't mean, you know, we shouldn't pay attention to diet. In fact, you know, you know what the Greek word diet, it's a Greek word. And you know what it means? A way of living. A way of living. A way of living. Boy, did that ever get perverted over time, huh? It's, it sure did. <laughs> but uh, I think that that's, uh, that's very telling that that was uh, the meaning of the word. Well, uh, I, each of us, you know, um, Danielle and Teresa, we all, uh, we're, we're colleagues and we all talk about the, uh, similar things, but we all have a little bit of a different orientation. So I think, why don't we count on that today? Okay. You know, why don't we why don't we go with our strengths, so to speak, in this whole area of nutrition? What do you think? Sounds good. Well, since I'm going to talk about the species and how long we've been on Earth, <laughs> I probably should begin. <laughs> so, um, first of all, nutrition, uh, as, of, as I've already alluded to, isn't, it, it, it isn't about uh, the diet or a weight. I mean, it is, but that's what all we think about it now, but nutrition is more about fuel. Nutrition is, is about what we need to live and be healthy and to uh, perform. And I don't mean in some tremendously uh, crazy way, like running a hundred miles or something, although that is all related, but it's just about being able to uh, get through a day, do the things we want to do at, at, our, at the very best we could and not have our fuel, like our cars, they wouldn't perform if we put the wrong fuel in or we didn't put enough fuel in. And it's really about that. So, so let, if we're going to put it in context, let's put it in context for this, the species. All right. Do you think it's pretty important what humans have eaten for 99% of the time that we've walked around the earth. I do. Yep. <laughs> uh, uh, because let's face it, uh, we survive because we were eating those things. Uh, and let's face it, our bodies have adapted to those things so that uh, that what we ate is probably what we uh, most need to be healthy and to be able to do our very best and perform at our very best. And so what did we eat? Well, we ate what was available and we had to work for our food. I mean, in fact, if someone has calculated how many calories we burned in order to, to gain a calorie it, that we could put into our bodies. And it was, it was huge because we were hunter gatherers. So we were gathering a lot. So we ate what was mostly available, which is fruits, nuts, vegetables, wild grains, you know, fish. When we could get a small amounts of meat, we didn't, you know, have the ability to bring down big game for a whole long time or until we domesticated animals. So we ate meat and we loved meat, but uh, we didn't have, a, didn't have access to it. So our bodies and our physiologies and everything have pretty much developed over time performing on what I described sounds like the Mediterranean diet, doesn't it? <laughs> Fruits, nuts, vegetables, wild grains. Yes, Danielle. 
So you mentioned small amounts of meat. It's just about the balance, right? Because how often could they really down a bison? Were they that good of hunters back then? No, no, they weren't. <laughs> You know, and uh, until we were, we didn't, it wasn't available and you couldn't preserve it. They didn't even have, you know, salt to, pre to preserve it really. And so it was a long time in our history, it relatively, you know, recently, I mean, in our history. And that's what we don't understand. The problem is this though, we ate what was available and uh, there weren't, these foods didn't have lots of calories, but they had lots of vitamins and minerals and those sort of things. But whenever we got a calorie rich food that was fatty, like meat or something that was fatty, we were drawn to it because that's what got us through the really famine times and the slow in the winters. And, and so we're, we today have, have an appetite <laughs> for sweet things and fatty things because that's what we needed. And we never expected that if we walked a hundred paces, we were going to be able, able to get that food. You know, we thought we'd have to walk miles or wait weeks or months and it was rare, but now it's everywhere. So this is the dilemma we have today that we, we have an appetite to uh, we're, we're drawn to certain things and uh, some of us more than others, and, uh, and they're readily available. So that's just kind of putting things in context relative to what we ate and what's available. So, uh, you know, it's been fruits, nuts, vegetables, while basically a Mediterranean diet for most of the time we've been on earth. And we found recently with research and science and everything, guess what? And in the blue zones, guess what? That's what they eat. They live long. They live healthy. The research tells us this is a, this is a, a, the kind of foods that keep us healthy and performing at our best should not be a surprise. It's one of those duh moments, you know, but but only when you look at life, you know, our whole species, not, you know, for, for most of us, you know, the way life has been the last couple hundred years is uh, must be the way it always was. Well, no, not at all. So anyway, that's just a few uh, little things to uh, to 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 kick it, kick it off. I mean, it, uh, it, it, it's, uh, it makes sense. It's intuitive, but it also gives us an understanding as to why, why we're drawn to things. And it also gives us an understanding that why we're seeing the obesity that we do today and why obesity, you know, is such a threat to us. Whereas even in my childhood, I've seen group photos of people. And in my time, they were it was very rare to see someone who was overweight. You know, really, it, it, it's amazing what has happened in just, you know, I've been, I've been around a long time, but it's a short time relative to humans. And uh, it, it's quite remarkable. And it's about that's a bit. True for, so. That's true for Danielle and I, too. Danielle and I are about the same age. And my pictures from camp, that's still true. I don't know about for you, Danielle. Yeah, absolutely. And I, Roger, I had a light bulb moment when you said we crave it because our DNA needed it and it wasn't available. Like to me, like, why do we crave these things? I didn't realize that it's hardwired. We're just not moving enough to account for what we're eating. Exactly. They, we were, we, whenever we could get calorie rich foods, whoa, it's a bonanza. I'm going to live through the winter you know, or the, or the tribe is going to live through the winter or there's the children will live because we found some calorie rich foods because they were rare. You know, you had to go out and, and, and walk for miles and miles and get these fruits, nuts, vegetables, wild grains. And, uh, you know, they weren't as calorie rich as the fatty foods and so some of the foods that we're drawn to today. So whenever we found an animal that was uh, so sort of left over from a predator who had left, had eaten what they needed and wanted, and uh, we beat other predators there, what a bonanza that was for us to be able to get that. And so that explains a lot. It doesn't necessarily help a lot, but it explains a lot. So I wonder what happened to your point, Teresa, about how looking at the yearbook, we were thinner and yet there's such an epidemic of obesity now. What happened in such a short period of time? It hasn't been that long. Yeah, I think to Roger's point is the availability, right? It, it's everywhere. And and the bonanza that Roger referenced, right? When we come across the the sugary, fatty, right? Our brains no doubt secrete those feel-good chemicals and it's like that's the bonanza. And and yet now sugary, fatty, all of those foods that produce the feel-good chemicals are everywhere. 
Um, and, and I think that's the shift. And then if food has been upsized, everything is, there's so much more that they serve you. The plates are bigger. The plates are platters, let's face it. And so everything has been, um, gotten so much bigger in terms of servings and just at your fingertips. I don't know about you, Danielle, but when I was a kid, if we went out to dinner, it was special. Yeah. Oh, for sure. And that's just not special anymore. It's normal. Absolutely special. I mean, uh, our God, I would say if we went out once a month, that was huge. Yeah. (laughs) Everything else was home cooked. And when you can cook it yourself, you know how much salt you're putting in, you know how much you can buy the freshest ingredients. You're not buying the cheapest ingredients. Yeah, exactly. It wasn't much of a cook, so we didn't overeat. (laughs) (laughs) You know, in, in reading your book, Roger, Live Long, Die Short, what really stood out for me, and it's so simple the way you put it, like we are w- version 1.0 humans living in a 3.0 world, or at least a 3.0 world. We don't know. It's it's at least that. And and that's really explained so much to me. And, and certainly in coaching, we talk about that we humans have a very primitive part of our brain, like any other creature, and its main job is to keep us alive. And Um, so of course, when we have difficult emotions in this life, in this version 3.0 life, our primitive brain is like, oh, that's painful. And this could be danger. And we need to numb that immediately. (laughs) And of course, it's very easy to reach for, um, the sweets, the fats, the uh, everything is at our fingertips. And, and so, yeah, it does provide a little temporary relief. It's a little temporary pleasure, but it's also a false pleasure, right? Because that, the feeling that prompted you to reach for the for the cookies is still going to be there waiting at the end of the day. And now you've got a net negative consequence because you've got the the consequence of the food that you reached for and you still have that difficult feeling waiting for you. So now you're kind of two steps back. Um, so in it's such, world, but it, it makes so much sense. And in our world today, that's also there's guilt involved. Yeah, then there's guilt on top of that. Sure didn't have the will to, to resist that, or you ate too much. And so that just compounds things. Exactly. But if we were willing to just feel the feelings, and even though the brain is urging us, which is always urgent, like it's been a really tough day, have the glass of wine or eat the chocolate cake or whatever the message is coming from that primitive brain. We luckily have our prefrontal cortex that can be like, no, that's, that's not going to change anything. It's inconsistent with our goals or whatever, like the adult in the room supervising Mm -hmm. the situation, we don't activate that. Then we just end up with those, you know, piles of of negative consequence of, of reaching for the thing. So maybe we, instead of comfort foods, we look for other sources of comfort from maybe from people or a walk or nature or a pet or. Yeah. Authentic, Mm -hmm. authentic pleasure. Absolutely. You know, Dr. Gobble, who you both know, had done a series of videos on nutrition for Masterpiece a long time ago, and he had mentioned about mindful eating, about savoring, and, and he said, okay, so if you are going to eat that sweet and you take a bite and you savor it, if you really sit and let it get this, that sugar get in the body, you're going to find that you're eating two bites instead of the entire cake. So it's not even denying yourself those experiences, it's just kind of limiting Oh, that's absolutely true. The, uh, you know, allowing the, your blood sugar to go up, uh, allowing the, your stomach to send the signal that it's filling and uh, therefore, you know, start to start to slow the process down. But, uh, unfortunately we're a, a fast moving society and we've become pretty much a fast eating society. And I actually find it interesting, you know, as I age, Um, The last year, my digestive system kind of changed a little. And so it really had me looking at what am I eating? Was it okay 10 years ago, but maybe not okay today? And so I took a hard look at what I was eating, how much, and, and got into a little more of, I was always into mindful eating and intuitive eating. So I'd like to talk a little bit about that because it ties into both what you're saying. Roger, to your point of if you're mindful and you're savoring and you really can enjoy the food, you can enjoy the company. And what's going to happen is you're going to slow down the eating. You're going to notice, hey, I'm beginning to get full. 
And in, in the blue zones or in the Mediterranean diet, they often advise, you know, eat to your 80% full. Well, most people blow right past that because they're going so fast. So if they're mindful, it's such a great, I love food and I love dining. And it's such a different experience when you slow everything down to fully appreciate it. And there's so many health benefits that go along with it, just and how your digestive system reacts, how your, your mental well being. And what I really got out of intuitive eating, and this comes from the intuitive eating book and workbook, is that they give you permissions. So it's, there's nothing absolute like, I am never going to eat sugar again. I am never going to whatever it is that you want to not do. And I'm going to exercise for one hour every day. They take a, for the most part approach for the most part, I will do this. So if I fail one day and eat more cake than I planned, or I don't exercise, that's okay. You know, just be, be easy on yourself. And they talk very much about honoring your body because we're not all going to look like supermodels. And I'm not sure how healthy supermodels really are if they're not, if they're denying themselves food, nothing against supermodels, but our body types don't necessarily indicate our overall health. So just honor whatever shape you're in and work with that. And I really like the idea. They don't say junk food. They say play food. So instead of saying, I, you know, I'm going to eat these chips. Oh, that's junk food. I, you know, I don't want to put junk in my body, but if it's a play food, it's like, oh, I can have a couple of them. Like it's just the whole approach to, to food. It's just changing the relationship. And I think the thing, this was even before I started reading about intuitive eating. When, when I started noticing changes in the last year, I took out just a spreadsheet for two weeks. I wrote down what I ate, what some of the benefits are like high in B12, high in A. And then I'd say good, bad, neutral, or good in small doses. And I check them off. So just looking at it, it was all right there. And it was all the Mediterranean diet. And you bonded with your ancestors and the blue zones and, and the people in the Mediterranean. And, you know, it was so beautiful. It changed the way I started cooking at home and cooking now has become an experience. So it just, I really enjoy changing the relationship because people think about diet and as a negative thing, but they can really have such a positive connection with food. Today, we, we've, uh, we've gone off the rails uh, and we alluded to it earlier, but uh, whenever we speak of uh, food and diet, you know, it's, it's almost always related to weight because we are basically an overweight society now, as we've been talking about. And, and you know, that's not to be ignored. Obesity is not a, a good thing. But the fact is, is that if we're active and, and we make reasonable choices, we really don't have to worry about weight. I mean, it takes care of itself. This is the way our physiology is. But in a society where we have calorie rich foods available, where we have a lot of emotion in our lives and a lot of stress in our lives, more than our ancestors had, actually. I mean, their stress was a lion and you either you lived or you died and then it was over. <laughs> but for us, this is something we carry around with us every day. And stress is huge, causing lots of disease. But part of it is, as I believe of that disease is because of things like eating because of stress, just as you said, Teresa. So, uh, you know, it, the, the conversation has just gone way out there, you know, where someone would, would actually recommend that we don't eat carbohydrates you know, because we're, we're diet fat. I mean, carbohydrates are the, are the fuel that our body needs. That's what we use. It's the only food that we can, we can break down proteins and others, but they go into carbohydrates and then we burn them. So, I mean, to, to have uh, something so bizarre, I mean, yes, you would lose weight. Well, you also lose weight if you don't eat at all, if you starve to death. Uh, so uh, that's, that's the point. And I, that's what I was hoping we would do today. And I think I think what you two have added and based upon, you know, our history, I think, I think we've been able to give them some really core ideas about this and not get all distracted by, you know, diets and weight loss. Again, that's, that's important, but not as important as nutrition. So keep it in context, you know, think, think of, you know, there are emotions there. There's the stress and the rushing and the, and, the, and the not taking time to be mindful. And then there's our whole history as, a, as an organism and as a species that, uh, that can't be ignored. <laughs> it, it, we, we ignore it at our peril and our health. 
to do that. So I think we've been pretty fundamental today. So it was pretty upstream. Upstream is the word, you know, that's basically going upstream to prevent things from bad things from happening. Good, good comment. Well, um, so let's uh, let's remember it's about nutrition and uh, what our body needs and what we need to be healthy and to uh, be at our best. And uh, that there's a whole lot of factors uh, involved. And uh, don't forget these these three that we talked about today. Thanks so much for those who are listening out there for this topic, Nutrition in Context. We'll see you next time. You've been listening to Dr. Roger and Friends, The Bright Side of Longevity. If you like the show, please rate and review and be sure to click to follow. 